Liam White's career has peaked, to put it kindly. Uninspired and burnt out, this character loses his will to finish his next novel and even shirks his public appearance commitments. To top it all off, Liam is told by his oncologist that his cancer has returned. Resigned to the fact that his life will soon come to an end, he begins a journey of reflection as he comes to grips with his life thus far and the people who shaped him for better and for worse. The Forgettable Life of Liam White stars Sean Woodland, Jasmine Guy, and T.C. Carson, faces that we all know that are familiar to us, especially if you're a child of the 90s. Written and directed by Harold Jackson III, this film is definitely one worth watching. I sat down with Harold Jackson III and Sean Woodland this week to get the background story on Liam White, how the film came to be, and what it was like to portray a character whose life was coming to an end. I need to know, first of all, how in the world did you come up with this subject matter? Because it's really intense. Is it from a personal place or uh, did you just, you know, kind of come up with this on your own? Um, it's not necessarily uh, from a personal place. So I've never uh, had a, a, an illness like okay. uh, Liam, like the character did. Right. Or, um, but it's 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 it is from kind of a personal place because because the film is more about uh, transitioning to a different phase of life than right. it is about uh, a guy with the illness, and it's about right. accepting, you know, what can come with you and what can't and sort of embracing who you're going to be, right? And I think that's a, that sort of message is important, especially in times like this, you know, at the particular time that we shot it, it was during, it was during quarantine. I could tell, so, yeah. So it was really um, important that when we went into this thing, it made everybody question everything. And then coming out of it, it's like, well, who are you gonna be now? You know, now that everything is turned on its ear, um, what are you gonna take with you into this new phase? You know? Okay. okay. Um, I definitely could see that happening, but it had to have taken uh, some type of a, a toll on you to come up with characters this complex, with relationships this complex. Like, is this straight out of your imagination or did you pick little pieces of people you know and kind of string them together? Um, I think I... Uh... It's, a, it's, it's kind of about my, my you know, just some stuff I made up, um, but it's stuff that I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what, what would happen if a father just is just an angry person because he doesn't want to know the truth? And that's sort mm-hmm. of his defense. Like, what does that look like? Right. Um, a lot of times you get this sort of uh, narrative about Black people, Black men in particular, that, that, you know, really, we were raised by our mothers and mm-hmm. fathers on that kind of thing. Um, so I did want to sort of throw that idea on his ear. Mm-hmm. And what is and what does it look like when a, 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 a grown adult male doesn't have his mother or never had it? Mm-hmm. And he's searching for it in people, in other women and other places. And even, he may not even know that that's what he's doing, but mm-hmm. that's what he's doing. If you notice in the film, all of the women Mm -hmm. that he has to resemble his mother in either look or um, uh, personality, right? right? So they either have a familiar look to his mother or they have sort of a very uh, uh, confident, uh, independent personality, Mm -hmm. right? And I think he gravitates towards those things because he's looking for something that he never got in the past. Right. I did catch that. And I did think that it was genius how you showed that the father raised not just a son, but a son and a daughter, you know, with an absent mother. Because like you said, so many times we see families that is the mother raising the children after the father is gone and the father is kind of emotionless and, you know, doesn't really care for lack of a better word about the children and how they've grown up and their well-being and in this case we see the mother who's unapologetically uh sure of herself and just like it's okay that i left y'all he's good (laughs) yeah everything worked out back up off me yeah (laughs) yeah and the way she says ah i let a boy raise you 
also kind of uh, turns her words on herself. She said he was good, but then in another sense called the father a boy and said that he let him raise him. And it does show you that she wasn't quite sure, but she knew she didn't want to take on the task of the children. Right. I think she, you know, this is something that uh, myself and Jasmine Guy talked about. We talked about not talking about it too much Mm -hmm. and letting um, Jasmine sort of figure it out why she made the decision she makes and mm. a terrible person was there something else going on and i think a lot of that is is uh, the stuff that the uh, jasmine guy did on her own um and i'm, I'm sort of an actor friendly kind of director i really right. respect they're insane but i respect yeah. what, what they right. do right and, they, and if you can give them the space and the opportunity and the and the and the and the text and the work so that they can actually utilize those tools that they that they want to utilize they can do some really beautiful things so i really mm-hmm. um just try to give them the opportunity to create and then you know shape the space mm-hmm. and then let them do what they do inside of that space and had you not said that i would not have known but she definitely made it personal or brought the mother to life when she said, okay, so he raised you. Do you, does he deserve a cookie for it? And you find that to be the case in so many different uh, scenarios in life when, yeah, you did what you were supposed to do. Should somebody pat you on the back for doing the work that you were supposed to be doing? And he said something to her that I had to write down and I wanted to bring that to your uh, attention. He said, there was nowhere else I could go to get what you have when they're having that back and forth in the kitchen. And that speaks true to what you said about him looking for her in other places, but could only get what she has from her. Right. And you can't, you can't get a mother's love anywhere else. You can't Mm -hmm. get it from a partner. You can't get it from the father. You can't get that. That is a a thing Mm -hmm. that you, it's just nowhere, there's no other person that can give you that. So um, if you're, you know, unfortunate enough to uh, have lost a mother uh, early in your life or at a at an important time in your life, um, or if your mother just wasn't around, those are things that you might not know mm-hmm. affect how you function in the world, but they Absolutely. do. Absolutely. So we find out sort of who Liam is in all of this tell me who harold is and how harold came to be and came to get into this particular field and write these particular people yeah uh, um it was really an in-between phase for me um i wanted to i was ready to work again and it was it was give or take right before the pandemic so the characters the film wasn't written with the pandemic in mind so all those sort of uh nods to mm-hmm. current events, right? Or those were put in there because it was. I, I felt it would be irres- irresponsible to make a personal movie in this particular moment, time capsule time, and not, and people just walking around like this is not a thing, right? You know? And there's no like, mention of COVID, no vaccines, no nothing like that. Yeah, no George Floyd, no uh, January six, no none of that. Right, you know. It would just be irresponsible as an artist to, you know, if I was making a rom-com, then you, you know, you give people what they want, right. you know, and there's, I, I enjoy escapism movies as well. So I'm not one of those, uh, you know, artistic uh, sort of sticklers, or, but, um, it, but that's not what this movie is. It's a very personal film. And um, I just, I just felt it would be irresponsible if I didn't address that stuff. Absolutely. And the way you did it was so spot on for exactly how all of these events are playing off in our life. They're all in the background. They're all on the news. They're all in little snippets here and there throughout our day. I think all of us in some way are thinking about it in the back of our mind throughout the day because you hear it on the news, you see it on TV, uh, vaccination commercials are running on the radio in your car. It's always there. And even though it was very present in the film, it wasn't overbearing and you still could see, you know, this is a current movie, this is what's going on in the world, but this is also what's going on with Liam and Liam's bubble that he has here in dealing with his mortality and his girlfriend and then the other woman that hangs out, you know, that right. blows into town very much like his mother. 
Uh, yeah. You know, she doesn't really have feelings for him, but she comes in to do whatever she needs to do. And then she goes away and she feels like he needs to be available when she's ready. That can think very much like his mother. Yeah. And I think that was that that first sort of opening was our real insight into who he is. Right. Um, we have him at a book reading that's not going very well. But if you listen to what he's saying, he, he essentially tells you what this movie's going to be about. Mm-hmm. Right. And then we find him. Uh, and we start to get introduced to his issues with women, right? When this particular woman calls, he jumps to it. And then mm-hmm. he gets what she wants. And then he wants a little bit more. And then she becomes unavailable, mm-hmm. right? That sort of shapes who he is. And now that you know who he is, you know, he's a, he's this writer who, who the, the peak of his success is not there anymore. He's on the downhill right. spiral professionally. and uh, health wise. Right. Um, and he has these, these really, these huge undertone of women issues that he don't, that he doesn't understand. And mm-hmm. now that you have this person, all right, now let's go watch him function through the rest of the film. I need to ask, where is this story going from here? Like, do you have hopes of, I can see it winning some independent movie awards, but what are your hopes for this particular story? Um, it's done, uh, uh, it's actually done really well. It was just yeah. at the um, uh, um, American Black Film Festival. Uh, I won Best Screenplay at uh, uh, Chesapeake Film Festival. Okay. Uh, it was at Martha's Vineyard. Um, so it had a really successful uh, film festival run, film mm-hmm. festival run okay. um, which I'm very proud of. And I'm very happy that people are getting to see it. You're, you got to see it, you know, these are, you know, th- these guys did an incredible job. They deserve for people to see it. Um, and then we just signed an, uh, a deal with uh, Roku. Ooh. So Roku uh, um, as a, 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 a exclusive streaming on Roku. So they'll have it for a while. And um, we're really excited about that. So the film will be released on Roku December 1st, this year, December 1st, so in a couple of weeks, or December 1st, 2021. Um, and go to Roku, see it if you can. It's it's a lovely film. It, it, it sounds like a Debbie Downer, but it's not. I think it's pretty funny. I think it's borderline mm-hmm. comedy <laughs> to me. Um, uh, and uh, it has a real holiday feel to it, ironically. It does. So, so definitely watch it during, <laughs> during the holidays. Trust me. Mm-hmm. Trust me on this one. Watch it during the holidays. It'll 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 sink in a little bit more. It'll and it'll feel more uh, alive. Because and then also um, we we shot it in late November, okay. So the Washington D.C. is where we shot it at. It was already in Christmas mode, mm-hmm. um, so we just decided to embrace it. And then Christmas is about a, a, a birthday. It's about life. It's about mm-hmm. you know life coming into the world, which is ironically what this film is about. It's more about being born than it is about dying. Right. Right. Seeing you. Where did you get your start and how long have you been acting? Um, well, I was, uh, I was in college at New York University. Um, I was studying the music business, but uh, somehow my friend group became all Tisch students and actors. So I kind of started uh, messing around behind the scenes and maybe acted in a student film or two. Um, but uh, this is, uh, the music business was changing around there and there wasn't much work for me to do. So I came back to Baltimore where The Wire was shooting. And I got my first audition um, and I booked a uh, drug dealer number two on the wire. That was my first time uh, audition. This was about like maybe 04, 05. So that was my you know first. What? I have seen role. you in the wire. Yeah. Listen, the wire is real big in my family. We don't do any street activity, but honey, we love to watch it. Okay. <laughs> my sister Great. still watches reruns of the wire to this day and i'm like you know now it does make sense because i didn't think i had seen you but since you were you know a supporting role that would explain yeah, why it i really look very is. different i had braids right and facial hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. right right but you can't change your eyes though so that so <laughs> you started off on the wire and how mm-hmm. did you end up as liam well um you know, I was kind of green back then. So I, since then, I've just been trying to figure out how to navigate a career, you know, you know, studying, taking classes and trying to network. Um, but long story short, um, Harold, the writer, director of Liam White, 
he had met a friend of mine who I was in a theater group with at a film festival. They were both uh, making the rounds. And my friend Thaddeus had, give her, had given Harold my information. And uh, I read for a film that he was prepping to do, like uh, the role of a Marine or something. But I think he had to end up scrapping it. So uh, I didn't hear anything back. Um, and then a few months later, he just called me out of the blue uh, for with a script called The Meat that he had written. And uh, he wanted me to play uh, the lead role in that. And uh, for me, that was that was uh, that was all I was asking for, because at that point I was just, you know, auditioning for mainly like co-star stuff. It wasn't any lead roles or anything where I could really stretch my legs, so to speak. So it was an ideal opportunity. So we did the meek and then uh, followed that up with uh, Unarmed Man. And uh, he hit me up again during the pandemic and uh, said he written Liam White. And, asked me what I thought about it and I love the script and uh somehow we got it done <laughs> listen and you did a very good job at it um I do want to ask how was it doing uh you know some suggestive adult scenes on on uh, in this movie uh it was like uh, we don't see anything but it's very suggestive yeah it was uh, it was very you know we kept it uh professional Harold uh you know he works well with the angles so that everybody feels comfortable and uh and you know clears the room so the environment you know is is safe I just wanted to make sure that the women were were comfortable like you know, I, that, that's not my uh first time being intimate on screen it may be like a, a web series way back in the day that you'll okay. never find but <laughs> so I had I had a little bit of experience with uh, on-screen intimacy but no it was fine it was a good it was a good experience Okay, good. So I want to know, because this is such a, he was such a complex character, Liam is. Mm. I want to know, how did you prepare yourself to play somebody who is sort of at the end stage of his life, but at the dawning of new realizations about himself? That's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I got the script. Uh, it was during the pandemic and there was nothing being shot. And I was, I was, I was, not having any existential crisis, but like, where, what's going to happen? Am I ever going to act again or work again? So I was in a weird space at that time. And um, upon reading it, you know, I think we normally as human beings, when we're faced with that stuff, if we don't have a disease or illness that's that's terminal, we kind of just push it off until mm -hmm. it's we're forced with it. So with Liam, when the diagnosis, I was kind of forced to wrestle with it because I've, you know, I have had family members who've you know, fall into cancer and mm -hmm. dealt with the situation, but to internalize it, and make it myself was probably the most, uh, the difficult aspect of it. So it was, a, it was a lot to wrestle with, you know, thoughts that you normally would, would put off until you are forced to. Um, but um, so, yeah, that was, uh, I just kept reading, I just read the script over and over again and just kind of, kind of let uh, Liam's thoughts run through my head and kind of, understand what that would feel like you know and uh I went from there okay compared to the relationship that you have with your parents how was it dealing with the complex relationships between Liam and his parents yeah it was uh it was difficult because I both of my parents are really are loving are loving people and uh and they've always given me kind of like what I wanted in, uh, in that regard but um I'd say just working with TC and uh, Jasmine, they were they were so gracious and they're such pros that kind of, um, and, and we didn't get to rehearse in person. Like we had Zoom rehearsals. So it was okay. kind of, we just kind of got the tone and structure, but on the day we we realized so much more and uh, kind of uh, kind of built, built that rapport and refined it, I'd say on the day. Um, but um, yeah, they were, they were tough parents. I'm glad my parents <laughs> aren't like that. <laughs> Who right. knows how it would have turned out. Right. So when you shot with TC, was all that done in one day? Yeah, actually, both TC and Jasmine was uh, consecutive days. We had got all okay. those scenes out of the way. So it was basically me and him sitting on the couch. You know, it was some heavy subject matter. But in between scenes, we were laughing right. and had a great rapport, which I think really helped because beneath mm -hmm. the surface and that turmoil in their relationship was a lot of love that they were hesitant or reluctant to express a lot of the time. Right. Very stern kind of father with a wall built up. But how was it dealing with a mother who almost spewed hatred almost towards you or like a little bit of vitriol? Yeah, that was very difficult for me, like because uh, my mother is not like that at all. And to imagine the person you're you know, you're seeking that, that nurturing relationship with to be so standoffish and so cold was a uh, was a struggle for me. And I had to uh, you know just relate it to maybe like 
personal disappointments. You know, I, I, I don't, I've never had that type of interaction with my mother, but just uh, kind of related to something else. I'm sorry. That's all right. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was tough. With the way Jasmine, uh, the way Jasmine took took it on was uh, it, it was it was helpful because it was like um, what we realized during shooting is that Liam is a lot more like his mom than he cares to let on especially with how he deals with people and women, mm-hmm. he can be cold and dismissive as she is sometimes. Mm-hmm. And um, I think his interactions with her helped him, helped him realize that that's not what he wanted for himself mm-hmm. in the long run and kind of changed the dynamic of how he saw Adriana, right. his father, all the other people in his life. What, what's mm-hmm. next for you after Liam White? Um, I have a, a co-star role on the, um, HBO miniseries uh, "We Own This City." Uh, I think it. I think it's probably coming out maybe in April of next year. Okay. It's a. Uh, it's based on a the book of the same name by uh, Justin Fenton, but it's about. Uh, it's around the post Baltimore and the post Freddie Gray riots, and there was a uh, gun trace task force uh, police who was uh, who was going around doing a lot of felonious things to citizens, and uh, it kind of documents the you know the story of the story of that. I play. Okay. Um, I play the um, police union vice president. I was <laughs> wondering what side you were going to be on, whether you were going to be yeah, on. Yeah, I'm with... on the other side now. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Hmm. Okay, so you started off at the wire, <laughs> drug dealer number two. Uh, you've been Liam, and now you're headed toward the other side, and you're going to play a police officer. Is there a role that you have not done that you would really, really love to? Um. Honestly, I've growing up, I've always loved action comedies. I haven't had much opportunity to, to uh, audition for comedies. I've maybe done uh, one, maybe one comedic film, uh, big time adolescence um, on Hulu. And uh, but I love the opportunity to do more stuff like that in okay. the future because uh, I feel like that's where I would be most comfortable as an actor. You know, I love. Don't get me wrong, I love the dramatic stuff, but I, I really do love comedy. I've always loved comedy. Okay, so this is one of your we could call it earlier films because you're going to go on to make more starting off working with tc and jasmine guy how in the world like who else do you hope to work with seeing as how these two are what some people would consider the apex for them wow that's a that's a great question i'll um Obviously, I mean, I can hear everybody say this answer. Denzel, I took some some background work a few months ago just because he it was a film he was directing in DC. I just wanted to be in the same space right. as, as him. Um, but I love Jamie Foxx. Like I said, I love comedy. I'd love to work with Jamie Foxx. Um, DiCaprio is another one of my favorites. Um, so the, the, those type of folks, uh, um, I'm sure I could reel off a few more names, but uh, those are the three that popped up my mind. Great, great job filming this movie. And I just want to thank you again for your work in it and uh, applaud you on the awards that are to come. Oh, wow. Thank you so yeah. much. For that. I Definitely. It. The Forgettable Life of Liam White will air on Roku on December 1st.